So welcome everybody. We're really excited to have you today. Um, and we are gonna do a whole bunch of stuff in the next 30 minutes. So first and foremost, my name is Curry Sautner. I'm the Chief Learning Officer at the National Constitution Center. And I am being uh, awesome. I have a co-host panelist with me, Jeffrey Rosen. Perfect timing, Jeff. Um, we're excited about class today because we're get to go over the 15 big court cases that are in the AP government exam. So many of our students on today are taking the AP Gov exam. We want to wish you the best of luck. We want to give you some content help. And also, if you have any clarifying questions in the chat or the Q&A, we will answer them for you as well. So we're going to dive deep into this. Jeff Rosen, are you ready to dive in deep? Just need your mic on and then we'll be good to go. <laughs> Absolutely. So great to see you, Curry. Love your backdrop and really looking forward to our conversation. Um, I was wondering if you were going to mime the whole thing, but that might be a little <laughs> tricky. <laughs> Maybe people would prefer that, but I'll, I'll do my best. With the okay, so Jeff, the way these are grouped together is going to help the students learn a lot about the court cases too. Um, so the first grouping that we're going to go into looks at federalism. So the college board exam picks two court cases for the AP Gov exam around the idea of federalism. And the, the class, the, the test, once you connect the dots between the cases and other cases. So Jeff's gonna walk you through the history of the cases and you can kind of take notes about some connecting points to the constitution and to the other cases as we go through. So Jeff, as we go into this topic, first I'd love for you to explain what is federalism for our students and then how these two cases kind of defined how federalism works in our country. And with these two cases, I kind of almost see them at bookends, not just the timeline bookends, but also how it gives power, um, federalism in the first case and how it kind of limits in the second case. So go for it, dive in. Sounds great. I would, uh, would love to give the big idea for federalism and connect these two important cases, which are bookends, as you say. And friends, um, you're gonna do great on the exam. For studying, you uh, have got this. You'll, we'll, we'll review the big ideas. When you go back to do the cases, you can go look at the actual cases themselves, which you can find online. And if you just skim the, it's called the syllabus, which sums up what the facts of the case were and what the holding is, you'll get the gist of it. Um, so that's a great way to study, but I'll just give you the big picture now. So McCullough in Maryland in 1819 and Lopez uh, in 1995 represent the expansive view of congressional power and then the limitations on that power. So McCullough in Maryland, basically this is the biggest debate at the Constitutional Convention. They wanna create a Congress that is strong enough to achieve national ends like regulating the economy but constrained enough so that its powers aren't unlimited and doesn't threaten liberty. And these two cases mark the two ends of that spectrum. McCullough is the debate over the national bank. And the question is, does Congress have the constitutional authority to charter a national bank? Alexander Hamilton, the rap star of the moment says that this is key to an integrated coordinated economy, but some Jeffersonian Republicans, including at times Jefferson himself, doubt that Congress has the authority to charter the bank. Chief Justice John Marshall, in his path-breaking landmark opinion, says Congress does have the power to charter the bank under the necessary and proper clause of Article I. And the question is, how strictly are you going to construe the necessary and proper clause? Does necessary means it has to be indisputably necessary and the economy would collapse without it? Does proper mean the judges should be second guessing exactly what is the appropriate way of achieving uh, Congress's ends? No, says Chief Justice Marshall. He has two big famous quotes. We must never forget it is a constitution we are expounding, which sounds very resonant and, and you kind of nod and think that's true. But what does it mean? It means that we're, we're not construing a, a, a contract or a, a technical legal document. It's a charter of government that has to be construed in a pragmatic, flexible way um, that's broad enough to achieve its goals, but not so broad that the power is unlimited. And then he gives more context to that quote uh, with his second famous aphorism, let the end be legitimate, let it be within the scope of the constitution and all means which are appropriate, which are plainly adapted to that end and which are not prohibited, but consistent with the letter and spirit of the constitution are constitutional. 
So that's a slightly wordy sentence, although it's well written. So um, we'll, I'll read it again because it is worth it. Let the end be legitimate. So that the end, ha if, as long as the end is legitimate and not prohibited by the constitution, then all means that are appropriate and adapted to the end and consistent with the letter and the spirit of the constitution are constitutional. So this is basically saying, don't be a complete literalist. Don't assume that if the power is not written down, it's not protected. Don't assume because the constitution doesn't say Congress has the power to charter a national bank. Um, therefore Congress can't charter a national bank because um, the power of chartering a bank is appropriate and legitimate in service of the enumerated powers, uh, including the power to regulate interstate commerce. And the court also rules that Maryland has no power to tax the bank because the power to tax involves necessarily a power to destroy. Okay, so that's McCullough. Lopez is the opposite end of that spectrum. Yes, says Lopez in 1995, Congress's powers under the Necessary and Proper and Commerce Clause are really broad, but they're not unlimited. And Lopez in 1995 is coming after a slew of cases between 1937 and 1995, where the court does not strike down a single law as exceeding Congress's power to regulate interstate commerce. And just for your background, not to give you another case that you have to memorize, but you'll remember that perhaps that in, uh, at the end of, in the New Deal era, in the 1930s, in a case called Wickard and Filburn, the court said, Congress can even forbid a farmer from growing wheat in his backyard, even if he's eating the wheat himself, because if he grows and eats his own wheat, he might buy less wheat and buying less wheat at the store might have a very small, but nevertheless sufficient effect on interstate commerce so that Congress can regulate it. That was a bit of a stretch, some people thought. That seems to suggest that anything that might have the tiniest little impact on interstate commerce is okay. Lopez says, no, when it comes to non-economic activity, the activity in question has to be substantially related to interstate commerce, or it has to substantially affect interstate commerce. So Lopez involves guns in schools, and there's a lot of concern about guns in schools then, as there are today. And Congress in 1990 passes a federal gun law called the Gun Free Schools Act, which forbids people from having firearms near schools. And Mr. Lopez is convicted of carrying a concealed weapon in high school, um, he challenges the conviction. He says that um, it exceeds Congress's power to regulate interstate commerce. And the Supreme Court agrees in this five to four decision. It says that carrying a gun into a school is not an economic activity. And therefore it doesn't qualify as the kind of private activity that Congress has the authority to regulate under the Commerce Clause. So the Lopez stands for the decision that even though McCullough and Maryland says Congress's commerce and necessary and proper powers are really broad, they're not unlimited. The national government has limited powers. And because carrying a gun into school is a non-economic activity that doesn't substantially affect interstate commerce, it exceeded Congress's power. Since then, the court has struck down not a lot of laws as exceeding Congress's power to regulate interstate commerce. And the big, most recent case, uh, the most important one was the um, Affordable Care Act case where the court by a five to four vote did strike down Congress's power to create the Affordable Care Act um, under the Commerce Clause. It said that the decision not to buy health insurance did not substantially affect interstate commerce. Nevertheless, the law could be upheld as a tax. Um, so that was uh, the most recent federalism decision we had. Uh, awesome. There we go. Thank you, awesome. Okay, Jeff, now get ready. This is the biggest block that you're gonna have to handle. There's six kind of groupings together. So yeah. this looks at the balance of order and liberty in the Bill of Rights. So with the AP Gov exam, they really look at that balance between government power and individual rights and how the Constitution and the Bill of Rights can be interpreted by the courts to continually uphold or limit civil rights and liberties of the individual. So here's the listing of court cases. And to make it even harder, we added this one to it too, because the students definitely have to go over Citizens United as well. So can we kind of walk through each of these and maybe take the first three in a grouping because they're all associated with public schools. And so there's our subgrouping of that. So Engel v. Vitell, Yoder, and Tinker, three great cases. Absolutely. And the first two are religion cases. So let's start with them together. They're, they're school cases, but they're also religion cases. And um, Engel and Vitale, has to do with the Establishment Clause. 
and basically says that state officials, including your teachers, if you go to public school, they are public uh, officials, public employees of the state, may not compose official state prayers and require that they be recited in public schools, even if the prayer is denominationally neutral and students can opt out of receiving the prayer. So that's a huge, important decision. In 1962, the prayer in question read, Almighty God, we acknowledge our dependence upon thee and we beg thy blessings upon us, our parents and our teachers and our country. And parents challenged this, arguing that it violated the Establishment Clause and the court agreed. Um, Engel was a kind of high watermark for separationism when it came to prayer. There have been a bunch of subsequent cases um, involving prayers in schools, including Leon Weissman, which says that uh, a school cannot um, have an official prayer at a high school graduation ceremony, even if a student recites it. And football games, the Santa Fe case, which um, suggested that uh, coaches can't um, compose the prayers. Again, even if you can opt out and they're non-sectarian. Um, on the other hand, there are other cases involving prayers at legislative sessions and town council meetings involving adults, where the court has said that those prayers even are okay, even if they're composed by public officials. So the big idea of Engel and Batali is a prayer composed by your teachers or your coaches or any um, uh, other public school official violates the establishment clause. Wisconsin and Yoder has to do with the free exercise clause. Remember the first amendment has two clauses. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion, that's the establishment clause, nor prohibiting the free exercise thereof. And the free exercise cases have given rise to a whole bunch of questions involving religious exemptions. Under what circumstances can someone claim, I am a religious individual, my faith prohibits me from uh, doing something that the law requires or entitles me to an exemption from something that the law requires. So the Yoder case involved three members of the Amish faith in Wisconsin who objected to a state law requiring all kids to attend public school until the age of 16. And they said this is contrary to their religious belief, which forbids parents from sending their children to school after eighth grade. And a unanimous Supreme Court agrees and says that an individual's right to free exercise of religion outweighs the state's interest in requiring the kids to continue in public school beyond the eighth grade, and therefore required Wisconsin to give a religious exemption from this Wisconsin law. That's a really important case, 1972. So many of the most controversial religion cases before the court today involve when do you get a religious exemption? So just about a week ago, we saw another of these COVID and religion cases where the court by a pretty close uh, majority, five to four, six to three, said that you can't prohibit um, gatherings of 30 people who are gathering for religious purposes from gathering in the home for COVID purposes because bike shops and grocery stores allow more than 30 people to gather. And the dissenters said, well, a home is different than a bike shop because people might sing and cough on each other and it's more dangerous to gather in the home. So it was a close case, but it involved religious exemptions. Or the Baker case, you all remember that uh, recent case. Can the Baker, who's he said his religious principles prohibited him from baking a, a wedding cake for a gay couple, does he get? Does he have to bake the cake? And the court kind of dodged that question on technical grounds. It didn't squarely say he was entitled to an exemption, but other cases have said that religiously motivated uh, organizations don't have to provide contraceptive coverage under the Affordable Care Act. They are entitled to religious exemption. So huge, interesting area of cases. The question of how broadly these exemptions sweep will be taken up this year in a case called Fulton arising out of Philadelphia involving foster care providers who don't want to serve gay and lesbian parents. And the question, should they get, uh, should, should Philadelphia be able to exclude them from participating or, um, or not? And we'll see what the court holds. So there, there you have the bookends, um, uh, the uh, Vitale case for the Establishment Clause, no state composed prayer, Yoder for religious exemptions, you can't force the kids to go to public school. That leaves Tinker, and Tinker is not a religion but a free speech case, and this is the kind of cornerstone of free speech law in schools. Th remember Tinker as the black armband case. A bunch of students during the Vietnam War are protesting, just as uh, 
students uh, are protesting today. So the Vietnam War was a time of protest. These students wore black armbands to protest the war. They were disciplined. They said that their armbands are a form of symbolic speech and should be protected. And in a seven to two decision, the Supreme Court held that the armbands worn by Mary Beth Tinker, who we've had the great pleasure of hosting at the Constitution Center and online, and her fellow students represented expression that was protected by the First Amendment. This, and here's the test. This is the thing to remember. The court says students have keep their First Amendment rights as long as their speech doesn't materially or substantially interfere with the school's operation. And in Tinker, there's no actual interference, just potential disruption, and this is not enough to survive a First Amendment challenge. And there's a famous quote from Tinker, it can hardly be argued that either students or teachers shed their constitutional rights to freedom of speech or expression at the schoolhouse gate. That sounds great. It sounds like, hey, you've got First Amendment rights in school. Turns out it's pretty complicated about what rights you actually have beyond this right of symbolic expression that doesn't substantially interfere with school operations. And the court just next week is going to have one of the most important online free speech cases in a long time. We're going to podcast about it next week. So check out the We the People podcast. The oral argument is on Wednesday or Thursday. Check out the oral argument uh, just for your own interest, uh, not for the AP test. And we'll have more of a sense of what the court thinks about speech online and how the Tinker test applies. And I put a link in the chat. We are having Mary Beth Tinker on Law Day on May 1st. So if you'd like to join that program and ask her questions directly, you can absolutely do that. Now, sure. when we, we talk about prior restraint, the next case has a lot to do about prior restraint. I find this one of the most fascinating cases in the lineup. Um, I always think of this as the Pentagon Papers. So can you tell us about New York Times v. United States and how that works with freedom of the press? Absolutely. There was a, a good movie about um, the Pentagon Papers case from a year or so ago, uh, focusing on Catherine Graham, the Washington Post publisher, who decided to publish the Pentagon Papers case. And it's an anniversary coming up. And uh, I think Neil Sheehan, the reporter from the New York Times who published the papers, uh, died not so long ago. Anyway, um, it's a huge case because the question is, can the government stop the presses? if it thinks that national security is in peril? And the answer was no. This is 1971, the Vietnam War has been going on for a long time. There's a, a, a guy called Daniel Ellsberg, who was a military analyst who worked on this incredibly long report on the Vietnam War that suggested that the government had been dishonest about much of what it said about the Vietnam War. And it was very um, pessimistic about the ability of the US to win the war. So Sheehan, gives the Pentagon Papers, which are 7,000 pages, to Neil Sheehan, a reporter from the New York Times, and uh, an, a, another set it also goes to the Washington Post. And the New York Times starts publishing parts of the report. And then the government says, stop the presses. This could harm national security. A district judge, amazingly, orders the Times to stop publication because it would cause irreparable injury to the defense interest of the United States. The case is appealed and the Supreme Court disagrees. It refuses to apply the grave danger rule of a case called Dennis versus the United States um, and said that any system of prior restraints of expression comes to this court bearing a heavy presumption against its constitutional validity. So. Um, in the US, you're not supposed to be able to stop the presses. There are a bunch of different opinions and different reasons for the that the justices gave for not stopping the presses. But a couple of famous quotes, um, Justice William O. Douglas said, secrecy in government is fundamentally anti-democratic. Open debate and discussion of public issues are vital to our national health. Uh, Justice uh, Brennan uh, famously uh, said that on public questions, there should be uninhibited, robust, and wide open debate. And uh, the Pentagon Papers reaffirm that. And then Justice Hugo Black, in a separate opinion, says the injunction against the New York Times is a flagrant, indefensible, and continuing violation of the First Amendment. The press was to serve the governed, not the governors. So um, that is a crucial precedent against stopping the presses. Now, friends, you may be asking, 
what are presses? <laughs> you know, <laughs> now, we're, now we're all reading our, if we, you know, if you read the New York Times or Washington Post or Wall Street Journal or any of those great newspapers, many of us, including me, now read them online. So it'd be much harder to issue a prior restraint because stuff is published instantly. Um, uh, but nevertheless, the principle of the times that let, let's say, um, the, uh, you know, WikiLeaks gave some material to the Times and the Times said, announced, we're thinking about publishing this in order to the Times don't publish would bear a heavy presumption against its validity because of this principle of the public debate is supposed to be uninhibited, robust wide and wide open. And broadly, you have to show that the danger is likely and imminent. Remember from the Brandenburg case, in, in America, you can't ban speech unless it's intended to and likely to cause imminent violence. It's not exactly the same test for when national this is the security. Next one. Exactly, <laughs> but thank you for setting it up perfectly. <laughs> but that test comes from the Schenck case, which sets up the idea that in general, in America, you cannot ban speech unless um, it's intended to cause imminent, serious, lawless action like violence and it's likely to cause serious lawless action. Now, if there's one test, there are not a lot of tests, legal tests that I want you to remember, and I'm not, I don't think you have to remember this for the AP test, but I want you to remember it as, as citizens and as students of the constitution. This first amendment test is an important one. Speech can only be banned if it's intended to and likely to cause imminent violence. You heard that during the second impeachment trial of President Trump, the whole, the whole question was, did the former president's speech, was it intended to and likely to cause imminent violence when he said, go march on the Capitol? That test itself comes from another case called Brandenburg in 1969, but it derives its foundations from this Schenck case in 1919. And it's 1917, and there's an Espionage Act that makes it illegal to share information with the intent of interfering with the operation of US armed forces. And there are speeches where people say, don't enlist in the draft. And those people who argue that you shouldn't enlist are prosecuted. And the Supreme Court upholds their conviction on the grounds of what was then called a bad tendency test. As long as the speech might have a bad tendency to encourage people to break the law, like not enlist for the draft, says the majority of the court, you can ban the speech. Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes dissents. And this is one of the greatest free speech dissents in American history. Friends, you know, I'm, I'm always giving you Jeff work, extra work that you can read for, for fun, I hope, because it's so interesting. There's a wonderful book called The Great Dissent by Thomas Healy. And it's all about the Schenck case and about how Oliver Wendell Holmes changed his mind and came up with this, having previously voted to uphold lots of free speech convictions, uh, dissented and in this case came up with immortal words that set up our modern law of free speech. And Holmes's um, beautiful dissent includes the clear and present danger test. And under this test, the court has to ask whether were the words used in such circumstances and are of such nature as to create a clear and present danger that they will bring about the substantive evils that Congress has a right to prevent it's a matter of proximity and degree, says Holmes. And then he comes up with this very famous metaphor, fire in a crowded theater. He says the most stringent protection of free speech would not protect a man in falsely shouting fire in a theater and causing a panic. Why not? Because if um, you stand up in a theater and falsely shout fire, that's both intended to cause a riot, which is illegal, and it's likely to cause a riot, which is illegal, and therefore that speech can be banned. But the danger has to be clear and present. And a different way of putting that is the language that the court adopted in the Brandenburg case saying that the speech has to be intended to and likely to cause imminent violence. Awesome. Now, one more case in this section, and it's Citizens United. We thought it fit much better in the Bill of Rights area, even though it is slightly connected to equality as well. So First Amendment case. Well, Citizens United is the case that by a five to four vote strikes down some of the uh, provisions of the uh, campaign finance law, the so-called McCain finance law. And it holds that money is speech and that the speech of corporations cannot be uh, restricted with the goal of preventing the appearance of corruption, unlike campaign 
contributions, which can be more heavily regulated because there's a greater danger of corruption, campaign expenditures, that distinction, which comes from the Buckley and Vallejo case is not intuitive, but let's pause to think about it for a second again. Contributions to an individual candidate, more likely that if I'm giving them a lot of money, they might be, I might be expecting a favor in return. By contrast, an expenditure by a corporation, like a corporation that wants to think, now just this week, many of America's major corporations are objecting to the Georgia voting rights law. They're saying, we think this violates democracy and we want to boycott Georgia or we encourage you, you know, not, not to support this law. So under Citizens United, that's a form of legitimate speech that they're allowed to engage in and they can spend money to create ads saying, hey, Georgia, don't vote for the Georgia law. There's an example of un lack of limits on corporate expenditures favoring a progressive cause. The Citizens United case involved an anti-Hillary Clinton documentary that the court said was protected by the First Amendment. So that case is contested today. People, uh, some think that uh, the court was right to hold that um, money is speech and that corporate expenditures should be protected under the First Amendment. Others think that uh, the speech of corporations drowns out the speech of individuals and the framers intended to protect the speech of individuals, not corporations, because there weren't really corporations at the time of the framing and therefore that the decision was wrongly decided. But that's the Citizens United case. Awesome, thank you. Okay, next grouping, we're moving along, looking at selective incorporation. So again, first explain what selective incorporation is, and then the three cases that could, will, could be on the test and could be on the essay questions are Gideon, Roe v. Wade, and McDonald v. Chicago. So three heavy hitters. The basic idea of incorporation is, does the Bill of Rights apply against the states? Here's how you can remember it. What's the first words of the First Amendment? Congress shall make no law respecting uh, the freedom of uh, speech and the press. It didn't say the state shall make no law. And until the Civil War, the court held that the Bill of Rights only applied to Congress. After the Civil War, the court began to apply the parts of the Bill of Rights applied against the states. And I will spare you right now the very important but kind of complicated technical debate about why and how the Bill of Rights applies against the states. All you have to remember for now is in the 19 starting in the 1920s and really getting up and running in the 1960s and early 70s, the court said that big parts of the Bill of Rights do apply against the states. And today, almost every provision of the first eight amendments applies against the states. Gideon is one of those provisions. Um, it was uh, the question of, do you have a right to counsel under the sixth amendment um, and the right to a court appointed lawyer if you can't afford one. Gideon is such a powerful case. You want some more Jeff work? Believe me, these are really great books. So um, please think about reading them at some point just for your own pleasure. Gideon's Trumpet by a great journalist called Anthony Lewis tells the story about how Clarence Gideon, this guy who's tried in a Florida state court on a felony charge, hand writes a petition to the Supreme Court saying, I'm entitled to a lawyer. It goes all the way up to the Supreme Court and uh, he gets one and having been wrongly convicted the first time because he represented himself of an alleged break-in in the pool hall, he's acquitted the second time because he has a good lawyer. And oh, the ending of the book gives me chills. Uh, Lewis asked uh, Gideon, did you think you accomplished anything? And he said, well, I, I did. And he did, he, he accomplished this uh, great incorporation of the Sixth Amendment right. Roe v. Wade, there's a lot to say about Roe v. Wade, just for AP purposes. Um, the court held in 1973 that a Texas law banning abortion, except in instances where uh, there could be, um, where a woman's life is endangered, violates the due process clause of the uh, 14th Amendment, which is broad enough to uh, en encompass a right to privacy, even though that right is not explicitly mentioned in the Constitution. Uh, and it also established a trimester framework saying that you can have no restrictions on abortion in the first trimester of pregnancy. You can begin to restrict it in the second and after, uh, which is the point at which the fetus is viable. And then you can have more restrictions in the third trimester. Roe is reaffirmed in Planned Parenthood v. Casey where it moves away from the trimester framework and basically establishes an undue burden test and basically says you can, you, 
restrictions before fetal viability um, are generally an undue burden and presumptively unconstitutional, and restrictions after fetal viability are generally more permissible. I think that's all that I'm going to say about Roe, except- And that's really about like the idea of privacy being incorporated for the students when they have to pull that idea out? Well, I'm so sorry to be, you know, to, to have to say that the opinion is not entirely clear about whether it's rooting the right to choose abortion in a right to privacy, or as Justice Blackman says, he says whether rooted in the right to privacy or as we think it is in the liberty protected by the due process clause, the right is broad enough to protect a woman's right to choose abortion. Blackman is criticized for not being clear about where this right to privacy comes from and whether it's the right to privacy or the right to liberty. But what's important for uh, us to say now is that the Planned Parenthood v. Casey case squarely roots the right in a right of personal autonomy, which it roots in the due process clause, as well as a woman's right to equality. And that's an important, important uh, strain. It had been championed by Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, and the court agreed that restrictions on abortion impose burdens on women that are not similarly imposed on men, forcing them to redirect the course of their lives and careers by bearing unwanted children, and this can implicate women's equality. Rights. That's what the that's what the court held in Planned Parenthood v. Casey. The last of our incorporation cases is also very controversial. Involves the Second Amendment and gun rights. There, there are two companion cases um, involving the Second Amendment. The first is the Heller case, where the court holds that D.C.'s ban on handgun possession in the home violates the Second Amendment. D.C. is a federal enclave, so that covers. Uh, you know, Congress's ability to regulate. But then the question is, does a similar Second Amendment right incorporate or apply against the states? And in the McDonald case, the court says, yes, Chicago had a similarly sweeping ban forbidding gun ownership in the home. And McDonald incorporates or applies the Heller right against the states and says that the states, as well as the federal government, cannot ban gun possession in the home. Here's one thing that's really important. That's a pretty narrow holding. Well, D.C. and Chicago were the only areas in the country that banned gun possession in the home. McDonald and Heller did not answer all the controversial questions that the court is facing today, including what about concealed carry laws outside the home? What about uh, bans on assault weapons, which have been proposed, um, although not adopted recently, although they were passed in the 1990s? Uh, Heller and McDonald don't tell us that. All it does is say the Second Amendment is an individual right that has a core right of self-defense and it applies against the federal government and the states. Okay, Jeff, it's gonna be speed dating for the next four court cases. Okay. So as we jump through, big one under equality, looking at the 14th Amendment um, and the Citizenship Clause, the Equal Protection Clause, and, and the selective incorporation around the 14th Amendment. So Brown versus Board of Ed, big idea there. And how do people, just like this six-year-old right here, change the constitution and clear, make the 14th amendment powerful. Brown, the most important case of the 20th century holds that uh, when it comes to schools, separate but equal is inherently unequal. Uh, the segregation that had been upheld in Plessy versus Ferguson violates the 14th amendment to the constitution. Um, separating students unwillingly um, is a caste affirming law that implies that black people are not good enough to go to school with white people. This is based on a presumptions of racial inferiority that the 14th Amendment is designed to eradicate. And the 14th Amendment guarantees that all students are entitled to go to public school on equal terms. Awesome. Uh, Next two cases are about equal uh, equality of representation. So Baker v. Carr and Shaw v. Reno. Um, and I think these cases are fascinating to look at how did they open up the dialogue and the conversation for the power of the vote and how we group votes together in districts, a part of the voting process I don't know if all of our students are clear about. Baker v. Carr, um, Chief Justice Earl Warren said was the most important case of his entire tenure. That's saying a lot because he presided over the Brown v. Board of Education case. He said in terms of its practical effects, Baker was even more important because it struck down what's called it struck down malapportionment. When Baker was decided, some districts had a lot more people than others. Uh, you, you'd have some districts that were 
uh, drawn really funny and had a handful of inhabitants, they might have one representative in Congress. And then you'd have another district that had hundreds of thousands of people and they also had one representative in Congress. So as a result, the votes of the people in the really populous district uh, counted a lot less than people in the district that didn't have a lot of people. So Baker v. Carr basically said, one, one person, one vote, um, that uh, districts have to be drawn in a way that people's vote are counted roughly equally. And that means they have to be roughly equal, equal in population. E uh, so um, that required a reapportionment revolution. People had to redraw their voting districts. And as a result, you can't have districts that have big disparities in the number of people who are in them. Shaw v. Reno is a case involving what was called racial gerrymandering. North Carolina created a apportionment plan that created two majority black districts. The goal was to give black people the opportunity to elect representatives of their choice under amendments to the Voting Rights Act passed in, in 1982. But the court said if the voting districts were shaped really funny, then they could create an impression that people were voting on the basis of race. And therefore, a, a district that looked really funny um, uh, had to, uh, was presumptively unconstitutional. I'm struggling to articulate the principle because the court wasn't all that clear about what, what was the principle of voting fairness that was applying. It was essentially an aesthetic principle that funny shaped districts create an impression of racially based voting. Now the counter of the dissenters was, well, there is racially based voting here. That's why they created the districts in the first place. And you're also not telling us what, what, what shape is funny and what isn't. And if you're gonna require the districts have equal population um, are basically contiguous and next to each other and don't look too funny, um, plus protect incumbents, you, you can't do all those four things because basically the people who are drawing the districts wanna protect their own seats. Republicans wanna have more Republicans and Democrats more Democrats. You can protect incumbency um, and have districts next to each other, but then the districts are going to look kind of funny, or you can not protect incumbents and have nicely shaped districts, but you can't do all that stuff. So really complicated area of law, but introduce the principle that districts can't look too funny when you're doing them to uh, maximize Black people's voting power. That's what the court case stands for. Awesome. Okay. And now this is our final one, kind of heavy hitter at the end. Um, we want to understand this idea of judicial review, judicial supremacy. Um, and what is the right balance with the courts reviewing and saying what the, it, what the law, saying if the law is constitutional or not, or the judicial activism? So a lot packed in there with this question. We want to go over the case and then all those sort of questions that the students emailed us about as well. You know, there's so much to say about Marbury. Right now, we're, we're at the end of our review, and I, I just I don't want to um, open up a whole constitutional law class. I, I, let, let's just, um, the gist of Marbury is in Federalist 78, where Hamilton says that when there's a clash between the will of the people represented in the Constitution and the will of legislators represented in ordinary statutes, we prefer the principle to the agent. The idea is that we, the people, are the principle and our legislators are our agents. And when there's a clash between the two, we the people have to rule. So that's the power of judicial review. It's, it's why Chief Justice Marshall said that the power to strike down unconstitutional laws doesn't thwart democracy, but upholds it because the constitution represents the sovereign people's will more accurately, more perfectly, more profoundly than ordinary laws. I think that is enough for Marbury but of course, you know that there's much more. It's a great story, but we'll we'll save that for another time. And and just uh, want to wish you so much uh, luck on the AP exam. And I, here's one thing I know: the fact that you have been joining this class and listening to our amazing scholars this hasn't been a thrill to hear Akhil Amar and, and Jill Lepore and all of our wonderful guests. You're the most committed students of the Constitution in America. I'm so proud of you for having taken the time to engage with these classes, you're going to completely rock this test. You've got it because you you just, I, I know how much all of you um, are committed to, to educating yourself about the constitution. So I have total faith in you. Study um, 
you know, as much as you need to. But the night before my history teacher always told me in high school, you know, get, get to bed early or uh, read something else or do something that is relaxing. So that you don't, at, at this point, you're, you're so well prepared that you don't have to cram up until the last minute and you're going to do great. And channel your inner Jeff Rosen if the constitutional question gets really hard and go for it. You can do it. Think about those constitutional questions. Remember to breathe. That was the rule number one. I used to hold my breath during tests. Not a good thing. Remember to tell yourself to breathe because that oxygen will help your brain. You have it in there. Thank you so much, Jeff. Thank you so much, students. I appreciate all the students that came to support your AP class and all of you who came just to learn about the AP court cases. So we celebrate you all. We thank you all very much and good luck. Have a great day. Thank you. Have a great weekend. Good luck.